Dobrý večer. Good evening to all. We have a new Prime Minister, Pellegrini, if you don't know, I'm sure that you all are happy. But today is not a day to be uh, happy from Italian Prime Ministers in Slovakia. And I'm not meaning it as a chauvinist, of course. Uh, but today we have a date which is a very difficult date, a difficult issue to talk about in Slovak society. I don't know whether you have been today at Šafarik Square. There was a group of people who were singing to honor the Slovak war state. And I realized once again that we have fellow citizens here in Slovakia who have still an emotional link with that period of our history. And it's not historical or negative. No, it's a positive link. Because if somebody has this need to sing in the square and to manifest the joy over that period, I would say it's a diagnosis. The working language of tonight will be English. Uh, I think you've been already instructed, but I would like to ask you to take your headsets for the case. You don't like British English. And there is simultaneous interpreting into Slovak provided. So if you need headsets, please do it now so that we have a discussion uninterrupted. And I hope that we will also manage to have some space for questions to our panelists. I'm sure that you know all of them, or at least almost all of them. I was told to change my position, so I do so. From the United Kingdom, Professor Roger Griffin. From Sweden, Miss Elizabeth Ospring, and after our show, she will be here to sign her book for those who want. And one of the most important contemporary writers, Abdel Kader Ben Ali from the Netherlands. Hello. Please. I know you. Yes, I know. Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, the topic of today is a theme which we may be discussed in Slovakia in a larger extent than other countries, though it's an issue discussed everywhere at various levels, and the approaches differ. That will be the issue tonight. And what we know about Slovak fascism is that we ascribe to it features which are linked with social failure, ostracism, with the feeling that the world in which we live we don't understand. And on the opposite end, we have also people who come here to tell us how contemporary fascism and populism looks like in other European countries, so that we avoid this cliche that the 14th of March is the day when we 
commemorate the establishment of the Slovak Nazi state. And today, today, the 14th of March is a day when the when Fico, our prime minister, was replaced by a new prime minister, Mr. Pellegrini. But I am not going to continue in Slovak to bother our guests and force them to listen to the interpreting. I will switch into English. But before doing so, I will thank you for coming here tonight. It seems that today fascism is not the hottest issue in Slovakia. The hottest issue is the current events. And we see You have some music, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much for coming. And um, um, as, as you know, we, we are going to debate the, the problem of uh, the relation between the modernity and fascism. And you are here because on the 14th of March, we have uh, proclaimed in this country a very strange uh, um, alternative kind of state, which didn't last, but managed to short, to short the lives of many people in this country. Uh, most of the Jewish people, people who were engaged in the resistance and the others. And, um, now we, we were already talking about this this afternoon, but uh, the new question for you today and this evening is, um, do you see any parallel between the political situation in early 30s in Europe and today's situation regarding the situation or success, political success of fielders in Holland, uh, the revelations you have uh, written, Elizabeth, in your books about the Swedish society, and you, Roger, who uh, you are still working on the relations between the modernity and fascism. And I will let maybe start Elizabeth. Please. Well. Uh, I think there are parallels to the Weimar Republic time, and I think there are parallels to the post-war years, just after the war, but I do not think that the 30s is uh, a relevant comparison mm -hmm. for us to make. Um, what's interesting with the Weimar years is, for instance, that uh, they, they had a they tried the demo democratic system. Uh, it was very questioned. And for instance, they had uh, a very well-developed hate speech law. So if you were the subject of hate speech, you could go to trial. And what happened was that a lot of, uh, well, Julius Streicher and Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi propagandist, uh, kings of propaganda, they knew this law, of course, and they broke it on purpose, time and time again, and the people who were subjected to hate speech, were mostly Jews, they went to trial. And each time they went to trial, the Nazis actually lost the legal battle, but they won the propaganda battle because they made the trials to scenes and they made the walk to prison into big demonstrations. So they knew that all publicity was good publicity. That's Goebbels' you know, main thesis. So I think this is interesting to keep in mind today. Uh, I don't think it's a direct parallel, but I think it's interesting. Elizabeth, does it mean that the legal system he, uh, maybe he's not able to protect us, right? Uh, well, I think the legal system can protect us, but we have to also know that these 
uh, in Sweden, for instance, we have Nazis on the street now and uh, violent racist Nazis. But I believe in not uh, forbidding them from from demonstrating. And Why? Because, because of several reasons, we should not uh, give them a separate treatment, but we should not give them extra um, attention. S attention. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and and you have to choose your battles. And I think um, we should be aware, be aware of that. These people know exactly how to gain attention because they see for every big story we make about them, they get some more supporters. So we just have to be cool, not afraid, but cool like how, in how we deal okay. with them. How, how do you mean that, Elizabeth? Like you uh, walking on the streets of Stockholm, you see a bunch of homeless Nazi because they're on the streets, right? Well, they're on the street demonstrating. Okay. Mm. And, <laughs> and you are just staying cool, right? No, of course, the individual, the Elizabeth, the mother, the person right. gets scared. But uh, on the other hand, I have my history uh, of, of the Holocaust, mm -hmm. where my family was murdered. They were, they were Hungarian Jews. And just because of that, I will not let a Nazi keep me quiet. They will not uh, make me stop going to places mm -hmm. or move around. They will not hinder me. So that's, that just makes me more determined not to let them get the power over me or my life. So this is the way you are fighting them, right? You are writing way, uh, books yeah. about them. Yeah. Not, not only about them, but also about them. Yeah. But this is difficult questions. We just had a debate in Sweden last autumn. We have a book fair, it's very popular, and at this book fair a right-wing newspaper was allowed in. And that created a big turmoil because a lot of writers didn't want to share the book fair with new well, right-wing extremists. They weren't Nazis, but they're right-wing extremists. And they started a boycott of this book fair. And I on the other hand, felt that if they are there, I have to go there. I have to go to the book fair to keep on the democratic talk, the activity as usual, business as democratic business mm. as usual, because they, sh they shouldn't be allowed to disturb us. But uh, you started to talk about the parallels with the Weimar exactly. Republic. I'm sorry, right? I left the subject. No, okay. <laughs> but I will. Just let me remind you that you started to talk about Weimar Republic yeah. and the idea of Weimar Republic was just let's have our usual democratic business, right? Well, and then we lost, right? Well, it's, it's, we, there are several reasons the Nazis gained power, of course, but I, I just want to, to remind about this very interesting fact that hate speech laws, now a lot of people are demanding tougher hate speech laws, and I'm not sure that's the right strategy. Uh, so I, I just wanted to put that little historic fact into the discussion to make it more complicated. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure, okay. anytime. Yeah. <laughs> so, Roger, please. Well, I'd like to point out some uh, big differences between the interwar period and now. Uh, the First World War had destroyed the faith of millions of people in liberal democracy, in progress, in the efficiency of Western civilization. There was a genuine sense that a civilization that could host, which could accommodate the First World War, there was something fundamentally wrong with it. That feeling created some wonderful art mov movements, wonderful jazz, wonderful surrealism and dada, but at a political level it was a catastrophe because liberalism had discredited itself. Um, I don't think many people realize that in the 1930s in Washington, 40,000 members of the Ku Klux Klan marched in Washington. This was a general crisis. And at the same time, there was an alternative vision of the future which was associated with Bolshevism and with Le the Lenin project for a new Russia. So there were three rival ideologies. Now, in the 1980s, um, 
except for some very marginalized minorities, uh, Bolshevism and I would argue equally Maoism have failed as systems and fascism though there are still fascists and there are still Nazis and there are still Ku Klux Klan, they are totally marginalized. The crisis we are experiencing is within liberal democracy. Really big issues about uh, t two basic things. One, within the European area should this area of relative prosperity and freedom be just for Europeans? And can we open it up to the millions and millions of people whose lives are absolutely unimaginably terrible while we are sitting here? So one is about how far we create a fortress of Europe, a fortress Europe. And the other is within Europe, how do you deal with problems of uh, Pluralism, that every Europe, every European country now, apart from actually Bulgaria, which has been remarkably good at stopping mass migration, every European country has many different communities of faith, of non-faith, different ethnicities, and different structural problems. And within each country, there are real issues about identity, about relating your personal identity to the EU or to the world. Many people come into the world and they have parents of different nationalities. There are, there's problems of migration, there's problems of internal migration. Now, these two issues of identity and creating a fortress Europe, these are very, very different problems from the interwar period. So I would say that though when you start hearing about ethnic hatred or hating uh, Muslims or whatever, it, it reminds us because of the trauma of the interwar period. It reminds us of fascism. The problem is not fascism. The problem is our real issues about access to prosperity, about hope, about and about identity. And I do believe that the, uh, each nation has a very different situation, but all of us have to somehow come to terms with, make sense of our little existence within this bigger situation. But compared with the interwar period, go back and look at it. This is luxury compared with uh, the early 1930s after the Great Depression. We do not know we're born compared with what was going on mm. in Europe in the interwar period and in America. Abdul Kader, uh, is this the issue of uh, identity? Yeah. What's going on here right now in Europe? Well, well, I think I think uh, uh, the, uh, when we talk about Europe, we try to see ourselves as uh, this benign, enlightened uh, continent that is uh, an example of humanity. But um, and that's how we want to see ourselves. But it comes at a price, and the price is the fortress. Uh, I. I live part of the year in Tangier, north of uh, Morocco. I, I have a Moroccan background, was born in Morocco. And when I'm in Tangier, I have a distance from my, from my apartment because I, I look over the city and then I see the middle Mediterranean Sea and I see Spain and it looks very pleasant to me because I can take my passport and go to Spain and do some shopping there and come back in time for dinner. But when you're an immigrant, then, then, then getting into Europe is trying to get into a prison. It's time to get into a prison where everyone is rich and, and you're poor and you want to be part of that prison. And when you understand this, you understand why uh, the Sub-Saharan, the Libyans, the, the Syrians want to get to this continent because they know the moment they're in, they're, they will be safe. And we tend to be negative about, about our continent. You know, we have, we have had this ec economical crisis. We, uh, you know, the economical growth is uh, is 1.3 percent, not 1.5. Oh, whoa, whoa! But um, for people from the outside, and then our direct neighbors. We're not talking about people in Asia or Latin America, but our direct neighbors: uh, Libya, Egypt, Syria. Uh, or, let's talk about Turkey. We are a, a, a beacon of, of peace and prosperity. But when you and then, I will flip the coin to an immigrant who has been living in Europe for 42 years, almost 40 years. That's me. And uh, and, and and when you look at Europe, it depends who you ask what Europe is. Because if you ask it to someone who lives in an affluent neighborhood 
with Dutch parents who for generations have been living there, then Holland is, it's his, it's his country, and of course, but it's also his place of present and future. If you are Dutch, but, but you have a Jewish background, then, then, then you will talk about the Holocaust. You will, you will talk about the Dutch as, as a people, of, maybe traitors of people who, and if you are the son of an immigrant, then you feel in a way, you feel vulnerable. You will feel very vulnerable because uh, not only is Geert Wilders using hate speech to create stereotypes of immigrants, to create stereotypes of Muslims. Um, the moment uh, Wilders is being brought to court, um, he was brought to court by a group of uh, Muslim organizations. I was against it. I was against, they asked me, well, uh, should this process be, 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 be done? I was against it because, as you said, uh, it was giving more publicity, more propaganda to Wilders. He could use the platform of um, the democracy, the court of justice, as a, as a place of, uh, to, to turn himself into a victim. I saw this, I mean, this is what happens when populists go to court, they become the heroes in the eye of the, of the, the people who are. Uh, and, but now I think it's good that these Muslim organizations went to court because as an immigrant, this is part of becoming part of the democratical texture of the continent. It's becoming part of, of the continent of Europe, using, using democratical means, using the court to, uh, to, to, to fight for justice so that maybe even if you lose now, you can still tell your children or your grandchildren, like, we went to court for that. We fought for our ideals because we believed in the system. So that made me very positive. But the, I will go back to uh, fascism in the 30s. Of course, there's no comparison because uh, economical uh, uh, circumstances were totally different from now, etc., etc. Et but what you see in the rise of fascism, fascism in the 30s, the, the rise of populist movements, is that though in the beginning these ideas are seen about, uh, you know, the Ubermensch, and they, 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 they're, they're seen as a bit lunatic, you know, this is, oh, these are st strange ideas about the pure race, etc. But slowly, slowly, slowly they find their way to the mainstream, and suddenly, People in the mainstream, institutions in the mainstream, political parties in the mainstream, they use this vocabulary of the, of the right wing, of, the, of, of fascism, to leg legitimize their, their existence. And this is actually happening in Holland too, and also in the rest of Europe, where 10 years ago, people like Wilders, Jean-Marie Le Pen, uh, Farage in, in, in UK, they would talk about immigrants as, uh, as, uh, as uh, second-rate citizens, as, as bringing uh, moral pollution, those kind of things. And we would look at them and say, oh, there's, there's strange people, what are the lunatics? But part of that discourse has been taken over by the mainstream parties in Holland. Part of the discourse is being used by leaders of Christian Democrats, socialists, and liberal parties, mm. and I think that's that's the, that's where the real danger is for, uh, for 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 the European project. Abdul Kader, what what does it mean that uh, the mainstream parties are finding the inspiration in this kind of uh, trash uh, yeah, speeches? Uh, what does it mean for you? Well, it, it means for me that I lose, uh, I lose faith in policy, uh, uh, politics. Mm. I lose faith in, in my leaders. I, I, I lose faith in um, politics as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as, a, as a stable force in, uh, in, in civil society. You, mm -hmm. you can count on these parties for their decency. They're decent. You, you might not agree with them, but you still. Uh, you might not vote for them, but you still, in your heart, in your mind, you, you find them decent and you trust in them. But the moment that a socialist leader is, 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 is say, saying things like, well, maybe Islam is the problem, or maybe saying, well, you know, maybe we should do something about uh, bringing back the influx of m Muslim immigrants, then I lose faith in these, in these, uh, in these political leaders. And I, it, deep in my heart, I'm also Machiavellist. I also know it, it's, you know, election time is coming, it's opportunistic, they have to use this, etc., etc. But when it comes to fascism, and the idea of the pure race, the idea of the, 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 the nation is one people, it's in the end not 
The fringe that is, that is in, in a way, accelerating this movement, it's, it's the mainstream that's doing it. When you hear the names Strache in Austria, Viktor Orban in Hungary, Marine Le Pen in France, and the others and the others, uh, do you think it's kind of a re the bad remake of history, or it's something completely different? Roger, Elizabeth, and then <coughs> Abdel Kader. Well, um, I'm not the good person to write to ask because I have a very firm opinion here, okay? Because I've spent a lot of my academic life trying to def define fascism. Mm. And so I've ended up with a definition which uh, distinguishes between fascism and various forms of right wing. So for me, there is a very big difference between populism mm -hmm. and fascism. Why it is important? Can you explain it later, okay. maybe? Well, I'll tell you why it's important. Uh, let's take uh, President Trump. Well, let's not take President Trump. Um, but let, let us try to think about President Trump. What is really significant to me is that two things. One, when Trump came up, uh, and the media started focusing on him. People, actors like Clooney, a whole load of journalists, and, uh, satire programs, cartoonists started portraying him as Mussolini, as Hitler, and also as the leader of North Vietnam. In other words, he started being called a fascist. One. Two, the alt-right, the, the, the neo-Nazi fringe in America, started welcoming him. So did the uh, Christian right, lots of people were, the liberals were calling him fascist and people on the extreme right were welcoming him. But his discourse has nothing to do with interwar fascism. Interwar fascism uh, in my book, I mean literally in my book, I've written books about this which uh, my students find very difficult but they're there, uh, says that fascism is a revolutionary movement which attempts to, to replace liberal democracy with a new regime based on an extreme form of nationalism. It, it is not possible to accommodate real fascism within a party political system. In fact, the first thing that Mussolini and Hitler did when they got into power was to dismantle the system. Now, unless I've missed a tweet, which is possible, Trump has never ever asked to dismantle the constitutional system. He might want to have another term as president, but he has not tried to do what's happened in China now and say, I want to change the law, I will be a perpetual president. He has not tried to change the educational system and, the, and set up mass organizations to create a new type of American. Uh, he is essentially nostalgic for a certain myth of America as white and self-contained, without migrants, without Muslims, etc. He's racist, he's misogynist, uh, I think he's got serious mental problems, but he is, he is not a fascist. And the, the, di the difference is very important because if we look at, say, Putin, when, when, when the Soviet empire collapsed, there were Amer the Western experts saying, the chaos of Russia will produce, this is like the 1930s, this will pr produce fascism. Look at Zhirinovsky. But the, they were looking at Zhirinovsky. But an ex-KGB Soviet, Putin, has actually corrupted uh, the, uh, Russian democracy. And he's done things like invade C Crimea, and he's, he's hosted extreme nationalism in Russia without fascism. The, the danger to modern liberal democracy doesn't come from fascism. It comes from corruption within liberal democracy. Now, I believe that Slovakia has one or two problems with corrupt politicians. If you, if you Not look... Not anymore, Roger. We oh, have that's a, good. You have, we have a new prime you minister. Have a new, well, a new dawn is breaking. A new world is emerging, uh, which will probably last till Friday or Saturday. Um, uh, yeah, but my point is a serious point. You do not need to be a fascist to be a horrible person. You do not need to be a fascist to corrupt democracy. It is the internal corruption of democracy that scares me more than fascists. It is the way democracy creates 
uh, corrupt elites. In Britain, we've had big revelations about how much money is in legal, this is legal corruption. In, it's hidden away in the Caribbean, it's hidden away. We've got uh, various ways, we, we, we're finding out about all sorts of scandals about uh, uh, how, how uh, people are paid in big companies, etc. These are the things that frighten me. A corruption of liberalism from within. Part of that is populism. But is it, is it, is it inherent to liberalism? Is it something we, we have to count on with, with the idea that the, the, the liberalism has the seeds of corruption in it? Well, I, I think uh, there, was a, there was a very interesting argument within um, Greek philosophy. Is it better to have good laws or good men or good people? <laughs> now... Um, Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Well, but the, the Greeks said men. Okay, the women. The women were doing the washing That's up and a, the shopping and things like that. Like me so, too for yeah. Socrates, yeah. right? Now, yes. the argument goes that when you have bad politicians, you mm. need good laws. But what you really want is good people and good laws. So you need a very good mm. legal system. Now, my point is that populism is more dangerous than fascism because it's not as extreme. It does not say we want a revolution. It does not say let us kill millions of people. But what it does is create a, a system which operates like the South African Republic of apartheid. If you are a certain sort of person, you have all the benefits of the system. But if you're of the wrong race or the wrong social group, or if you're a migrant, or if you're disabled, or if you're a woman, or whatever, you do not have access to. So liberalism has to constantly be improved and struggled for and democratized, because left to itself, it is always going to be used by elites and turned into a perversion of itself. Is this the, the, the actual danger in Europe, this I, kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, I find it interesting. The interwar period is, was so traumatic in our history, especially here and in Eastern Europe, that we're still talking about fascism. But I'm much more interested in the terrible corruption of liberal democracy in the 20th century. And I think it's going to, that is what we, next year, when you have another day, don't talk about fascism. Look at the way you've got good laws, you've got good constitutions, you've got lots of idealistic young people, you've got good teachers and TV producers and TV, everything, but you've got lots of very corrupt, egotistic, uh, selfish people mm. who are destroying democracy from within. And they, wear, they don't wear Nazi uniforms, they wear suits and ties, and they speak very good Slovak language, but they are... Not the, all they, of them, they, Roger. They, they are the danger, okay? <laughs> Elizabeth, please. Well, uh, yes. <laughs> no, I think this is, this is, of course, very important, and, and I've read your uh, definition of fascism, and that is my lead when I look at things. Does this match with Roger Griffin's definition of fascism? So, uh, But I just want to add, uh, I've just uh, written a piece about Hungary. There's an election in Hungary in April. And the word, I mean, we all know that um, Viktor Orban himself describes his, his rule as uh, Ill, illiberal democracy. And also that uh, the Swedish popular right-wing party, they have this as an ideal, and it's also the Putin way of, of ruling. And then we have, what, what is the result of this? Is this fascism? No, it's something else, and it's a word that's been around for about 10 years. It's soft authoritarian, oh, I can never say soft that. Soft authoritarianism. Yeah, this is a <laughs> terrible word, but please say it again. Soft authoritarianism. Yeah. Say it in Swedish. Soft, yeah, mjuk auktoritat. Oh, yeah. yes. I can speak Swedish if you want that. <laughs> it's something with authoritarian that just won't go. It's Freudian, I think. Uh, the Democrat, <laughs> the Democrat <laughs> really? in me doesn't want to say it. Uh, but anyway, so this is, this is very interesting, because what is this? What does he do? Well, first of all, he goes 
against the democratic principle of keeping, for instance, the legal system separate from the politics. He appoints new judges that have a political agenda. And also the other pillar of democracy, the free media, that he has also taken control of. The media that were critical, they're shut down or bought up. Putin. Yeah, that's Putin, that's Viktor Orban. So with an, from another point of view, I can only say I agree completely with this and analysis. He down a major university. Yes, and yes, he closes down everything that he conceives as a threat. And at the same time, he goes on about immigrants. And Hungary has hardly any immigrants. There aren't any. I think there are about 2,500 immigrants the latest years in, that were let into the country. But he keeps the people obsessed with immigrants and goes on with his business. So this is what I fear uh, from a Swedish Scandinavian perspective because the right-wing party we have in Sweden are quite big and they have Hungary as an ideal. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, yes. As an ideal, right? Like, we want to be like Hungary. Yeah, they think the cultural mm -hmm. politics are great, for instance. Mm -hmm. When you take away all the, the bosses of the theatres and the, the mm -hmm. publishing houses and put new ones there that are politically loyal. So it's a terrible scenario. Mm -hmm. mm. Abdul Kader, what's wrong with democracy? Why there is so many voices telling that there is something corrupted with democracy? Well, I, I think. I think a, a, a liberal Western democracy is good when you're winning. Uh, I, I grew up uh, just after the fall of the wall in Holland. My teacher of history, the, the day the, f the wall fell in Berlin, the next day I was in history class and I, I loved history and I loved the teacher. And before he started, I think we were doing the, 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 another field revolution, the French Revolution. And, and so, but before doing that, he said, before I say anything about the French Revolution, I want to talk to you about today. Because you are living a historical moment. The wall fell yesterday, and you will be of a generation that will tell his grandchildren about that, that, that you were sitting in the classroom and your teacher told you that. And the idea was, of course, that it was a sign of hope. The idea was, a, it was, this means hope, because liberal democracy has conquered its biggest enemy, communism. For the last 50 years, it has conquered, communism is, is dead, and now liberal democracy will do its work, Fukuyama, the end of history. And I plucked the fruits of that. You had the Erasmus uh, uh, travel uh, boards. You, there were no the, the borders uh, were lifted. You could go to Budapest in one day. It was you, you know things were cheap. We got we were working towards a, a, a unified European Union. Suddenly you wake up and it's 9/11, and I think 9/11 was for me the day that liberal democracy was found out that it was was very vulnerable, that that idea of power and optimism and, and indestructibility, uh, thank God I can pronounce this word. <laughs> that, Don't say soft or soft. No, 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 I'm, actually I'm, what I'm doing now is my whole talk is trying to avoid saying that. <laughs> so 9-11 was the end of the end of history. It in was way, when it, history we woke, came back we woke up and hit and, us in the face. And we, and we yeah. all said, what a mess. Yeah. What a mess we're in now. And the, the right answer, we immediately felt it's not going to be war, but there has to be war. We felt, so, so what you have now is, we don't, we don't want to go to war, but we have to go to war. We don't want to think about ideology, but we have to think about the ideology. And I think we lost a sense of direction. The issues of identity, belonging, religion became very, very important because, because the attack on the Twin Towers was explained as an attack on values, on, on identity. And I think we're still in this debate. We, st we still did not figure out where we are. And, 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 and after the wars of Iraq and Syria, it, there's no end to it. The, the, what I found out in, in, in my travels in, in Europe is that people, one side, feel European. But what they feel more instinctively is this, the sense of belonging. They want to belong to a family, to a nation. And I think that 
in the, in the success story of the Euro European Union, we forgot we liberal intellectuals, drinking cappuccino and eating croissants, we, we forgot to think about what, it is, what does it mean to belong to a nation and, and to think about it in a progressive way, to think about a nation being a place where you feel secure, where you feel safe, where you can grow together, where your family is safe and you can think about responsibilities and where things like freedom and freedom of speech and freedom of religion, etc., are tightly are bound with the idea of, of the nation. And I think that the idea of nation and nationhood is, has been hijacked by the populist parties. I've, I was in, in uh, a couple of years ago, 2006, I was in Croatia, Zagreb, wonderful country, a great time. I was sitting with his two students of Dutch and in a bookshop and I heard this, this, this shout of heavy metal, heavy metal. And I said, what is this noise? It sounds like bad music in Croatian. And they told me, oh, well, you know, you don't want to know, you don't want to know. Well, then I get curious, so I said, what is it then? And they told me, you know, there's a big concert on the main square. They want, there are now 100,000 people bringing the Hitler salute. I said, Hitler salute on, on your main square? Why? Because there's this neo-fascist heavy metal band. And suddenly I understood, whoa, why are we not talking about this? We're talking about Brussels. We're talking about unifying, but we're not talking about an undercurrent in Europe, which is very, very strong and gives rise to ultranationalism because we are not man enough or people enough to define our progressive idea of what it means to be part of a nation. But the idea, Abdul Kader, was that the nations were the main source of conflicts in Europe, right? So that's why we had this idea for, for many decades yeah. that the, the, the concept itself of nations has to be overcome. And now you are saying that we have to go back somehow to the concept of the nation, right? I think we have to go forward, forward, forward always mm. forward, always forward, and 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 we because even uh, we talked about this um, uh, this afternoon about the, the the young people of the banlieue of Paris. They they, they grew up in the banlieue. It's 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 not a, it's it's not a bad place to grow up, but but it's being portrayed in the media as a very bad place to grow up because immigrant immigrant problems, etc., etc., et fundamentalism, etc. And they call, the young people call themselves beurre. Uh, butter, so a, a, a mishmash. And they hate France, they hate the flag, they hate uh, Sarkozy, they hate everything what, what, what is so-called France because it's associated with white and secular and privileged. So France for them is the place they will never arrive to. But when the national team plays, they, they're the first who shout out the Marseillaise. And the moment they are shouting this national anthem, it's like, it's almost as if they are uh, internalizing the national anthem of France, turning it into some Burr song, like this is our song, it's a song of protest. We're proud of it, but it's a song of protest. And I think that's another definition of how you can define what it means to be citizen of, of a country. Because one way or another, we have to tell our children people what it means to be a citizen of a country. But is this the, the, the problem of uh, populism only the problem of uh, identity today in Europe? It's a question for you. Ro Ro Elizabeth, Roger, Roger Elizabeth. Well, I'm... No, no, <laughs> please. Elizabeth. Well, no, the, the, what I see uh, the problem of populism is, is uh, the problem and this is not an original analysis, so I won't pretend it, but, but I'm, there is huge uh, social and, and economic in inequalities. And the globalized world uh, makes us see them even more uh, clearly. We, uh, the globalization has increased the inequalities, that's one thing, but the other thing that globalization does is that we are aware of them. We are aware of that people in, in Stockholm are, they're having a much better life than the people, I don't know, in, in uh, some city in Romania, maybe. The, so the, the, the view of oneself, the possibility of wanting another life, a better life, and becoming 
um, dissatisfied and maybe not feeling hope, that has increased and that's the, always the base of populism, of course. So that is one aspect. And I just want, yeah, I want to add to what you're talking about concerning the nation because nationalism doesn't have to be a bad thing. I agree with you on that. And I have this uh, dream of changing y Europe's way of looking at nationalism and citizenship because it's based on how does one become a citizen in Europe. And in the most of European countries, it's based on blood, on heritage, on who your parents are. If, if your parents are this, you can become a citizen. But if we take the US or Canada, who are typical immigrant countries, and they also define themselves as immigrant countries, they have another principle for citizenship, and that is anyone who is born within the borders is an American. It doesn't matter where your parents come from. It's if you're born there, you're American. And this is a, a nationalism uh, that I, I find much easier and even beautiful compared to the blood-stained European tradition. You, you told us this afternoon when we were discussing this issue that this is a real uh, legacy of Adolf Hitler, right? Well, it's become... Now, these ideals were actually the result of the French Revolution. The, mm. they, they were very strong into the blood heritage, only the really French could be French, and the children of the French could be French. And the interesting difference is that you put then, it, it's if you use the Greek word ethnos, in, in, uh, contrary to demos, the, uh, the group, the language, the culture is the priority, mm. instead of the citizen within the territory. So it's two different principles, and deep under, our societies are very affected of the way we look at citizenship, mm -hmm. even here and now, I would say. Okay, so this is another explanation for you, right? The, the social... Yes, it is, and it's also a way mm -hmm. of rethinking nationalism, mm -hmm. that it doesn't have to be bad. Um, Can we, this is a very British story, right? When you travel to London, and you go to the bookstores, you have um, a feeling that the British won the First and the Second World War alone. Yeah. Well, it's true, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> we, we had a little bit of help from the Americans. They were late as ever. Uh, and, and the Russians made big sacrifices, but then they had the wrong sort of system. Whereas the British, from the start, we had the right system, <laughs> and we had the right leader, and he's just won an Oscar. Um, in, in Hollywood. Yeah, no, I mean, every, every country needs myths of specialness. Uh, everywhere you go, uh, I mean, my mother was a classic patriot. She thought English was objectively the most beautiful language in the world. Now, I have a, an, an Italian mother-in-law, and she is equally stupid about Italian. Uh, but... Uh, <coughs> I mean, she, she says English is ugly. Why do they put the adjective before the noun? Uh, that means there's something wrong with them. And when, she, when I say something in English, she, she, make, she does a parody. She does a Monty Python parody. And I love her for that because she has this sense that, I mean, millions of Italians, they, they don't feel Italian uh, except in the World Cup. Um, uh, but they feel my, my mother-in-law is Genovese and she speaks dialect and then she's Italian and, and she's patriotic and she hates the French and she hates the English and she hates me because I married her daughter. But she has, a, she has something really deeply rooted and she's extremely generous and kind and she's part of and all over the world I could go to a I've been in Sri Lanka I've met people like my mother-in-law and my mother in Sri Lanka there's a wonderful documentary made by the BBC uh, what people probably know in Slovakia is that the SS in G Nazi Germany were obsessed with uh, stealing children who looked Aryan 
to, to increase the number of Aryans. And in Poland, they found a lot of children who looked Aryan, and they would take them to a, a testing center, and they would be tested for their Aryanness. And one test was how they sat. So if you sat like I sit, then you would end up in a concentration camp. But if you passed the Aryan test, you would be a you would be brought up by a, a, an SS family and turned into a German. Now, there was this case of a boy who uh, was brought up by Nazis, and he had Nazi father and mother, and he loved them because they were parents. And after the war, he found out that he had a Polish mother, and he went back to Poland to visit her. The Poles took his passport, and he couldn't go back to Germany. And so he stayed in Poland till his mother died. And now he teaches German in Poland, and he did this documentary. And he, he compared his two mothers, and he talked, he loved them both, he spoke Polish to them both, he, he compares the two personalities. And at the end of the documentary, he says, I'm making this documentary to show you how absurd it is, how mad it is to believe in racial superiority. When you, when you can enter into different cultures, you find the same phenomena. Love is love, culture is culture. And he experienced this wonderful universality of humanity, which is turned into millions of dialects. There's a Slovak way of being and a Czech way of being. And in Britain, Britain is interesting because we have so many ethnicities, and the first generation of Muslims who come to Britain, Bangladesh or whatever, are still very much rooted in that, but their children, their children are going to university, they're becoming lawyers, they're becoming news readers, they're becoming rap artists, they're and they are creating new ways of being British. Now one thing I like about America is if you talk to an American about their ethnicity, they have hyphenated ethnicities. I am Afro-American, I, I am, uh, I, I am Anglo-American, whatever. In Britain, linguistically, people still think of themselves as English. I'm not English, I'm Anglo-British. Mm. And there's many ways of being British. And once we accept that a nation like Slovakia can have many ways of being Slovak, mm. and that we are all, there, there's ways of being uniquely Slovak, where you're part of a bigger thing called Slovakia, you're part of a bigger thing called Europe, part of a bigger thing called humanity, then we stop hating people and we become interested in the difference and the similarity. Elizabeth. Well, I was just... Uh... <laughs> I love you. Yeah. You'll have a special lecture this <laughs> evening. Yes. No, I was just thinking of this word you were using, patriot, mm. which is a very interesting word, uh, <coughs> because you can be a patriot in, in so many ways, and it's got nothing to do with the nation. You can be sort of close to your hometown, you can be in your culture or in your language, but the, the original meaning of it in the Swedish context in, in the 17th century actually, or 18th century, when it came through the, from the French Revolution, it actually meant a person who wanted to do something good for the society. Yeah, the common good. It's connected to the, to the words, the common good. And this is also a very, it's a beautiful ideal that we've sort of lost somewhere. Well, well you know, I, I love the identity politics, you know, hybrid, this hybrid Afro-American, uh, Latino, Puerto Rican, uh, Romanian, wonderful. But the, but the moment you have a society which defines itself into the extreme, into identities, then the, the second question is, what, what is then, the, what binds it together? What is the com common good? And you find out that the moment you say, you are this, you are that, then, then, then also, you, the, the in, every group has its own interests. Yeah. And they will always go into conflict with the interests of the other group. Look at, in Holland, we have a big discussion about women in higher positions in finance and, and banking and, and the high echelons of, of uh, that there are not enough women. So you have identity politics. We want more women. But the men are saying, but things are going all right. 
things are working for the common good, the moment we, we are imposing more women on these positions, we will, we will weaken the system. We will maybe make uh, uh, decisions that are not based on qualities, but on quota. And I think this is, this is something we have to take into account when we talk about this utopia of, of that every identity is recognized in itself. Because, because you can do this, but at the same moment, you have to open discussion of what is your uh, responsibility and what can you do for the common good? What can you do for the common good? Can you also, because not only do we teach our children who they are, where they come from, which is good, because when it comes to, to question about slavery, anti-Semitism, minorities, all these people have a right to be acknowledged in their history, in their pain, in their trauma. But the moment we recognize this, and you open the debate, you also have to open a debate about, but then what, what is your responsibility in, in, in the society as a whole? And we are struggling with it in Holland. We are struggling with it. It's not easy. Well, it's all over yeah. Europe and the US. And, and the thing with the identity, the fixation with identities, maybe, it, I mean, to be recognized for one's history, but when it goes on, I, I feel that in Sweden the mm. debate has become more of who is saying things instead of what are they saying. Mm -hmm. uh, agency. Yeah, agency representation has become very important, even more important than the arguments <laughs> that are actually brought into the, to the talk. So this is also, I think, a danger to democracy because it's it's anti-universal, the idea of universality. Th th this is the question. This is the question. What is the part of universalism in the idea of the nation, right? Because I, I, I will come back uh, to the Slovak history and its very universal history of Second World War. The Slovak nation was more important than all the others for some political leaders here. So. How can we do all the things you were talking about, the cooperation, the, the, the sense of togetherness, uh, patriotism, like trying to do some good stuff for the others, when on the other side you think that you are better than the others? Well, you learn you're not better than the others. I mean, if you... Uh uh, I mean, I was brought up in an extremely patriotic country. I was born in 1948. Uh, we had just won the war with a little bit of help. We, we just lost a lot of empire. Uh, I, I was taught to love the Queen and love English and love Shakespeare. And I even thought English food was good. I mean, I was, I was totally brainwashed. Um, uh, at that time, we used to play good uh, football, and then, then a certain uh, Pushkas uh, from Hungary uh, showed us that we couldn't play football, and we have never really played good football. Um, even when we buy foreign players and they play for Manchester United, it's a disaster. They come to us and they can't play football anymore. So I have gradually learned in my life... Are you talking about Slatan Ibrahimovic now? No, not to us. Uh, <laughs> so, but my I, Swedish I, sentence, yes. Sorry. I'd like to be serious. That it, I, was, I, was in, I was brainwashed as a white male English child mm. with an extraordinary degree of imperial racist arrogance mm. towards other cultures. That's how we were brought did up. You, did you believe to it? No, well, I did. Yes, I did. Mm. Um, I felt almost sorry for foreigners that they weren't English. Um, yeah. <laughs> Till I was, you know, I was talking, I was very young. And uh, in the course of my life, in the course of my life, I have had to understand that my country historically did, has done terrible things. It, there's no such thing as good imperialism. There's no such thing as benign colonization. We did terrible things in, uh, to, to African slaves. We fought terrible wars. We've colonized people. We did terrible things. In our, so gradually, I have, my sense of national pride has become smaller and smaller. Mm. And I've ended up, and especially being married to an Italian, uh, women are good at putting men in their place. Italian women, I don't know about Slovak women, but they're very good at putting the male ego in its place. And I've ended up, 
I've ended up becoming part of a world community precisely because I, do, I no longer see Britain as my home. There are many things about contemporary Britain I am deeply ashamed of. I am ashamed of what we did in the Industrial Revolution, what we're doing to our younger generation who can never afford a home, uh, what we did to the regions, the way we treated Scotland and Wales. And I, I have learned all these things, and yet, and yet, I feel proud of the things I think we get right, and I feel ashamed of the things we get wrong. And every country I get to know well, and I speak several languages, there's the same mixture of beauty and, cr and crimes against humanity, of corruption and idealism. Uh, babies are still amazing in their potential. Uh, I, uh, there are global forces working against humanity. There are local forces. And I just see a, a common struggle, a common humanity. It's not a myth. It's not an abstraction. And I just know that every, in a way, there is a universal story that we are all part of. And we have to fight locally for global values. Uh, it doesn't matter where you are. Yeah. Elizabeth, you wanted to add something, I think, no? Uh, well, no, not particularly uh, but you can. to this, but I can. <laughs> well, what is the question? I think we'll have to go back to the question in that yeah, case. The, the, the question is still the same, the, 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 the tension between the, the idea of nation and the idea of universalism. Well, I don't think there has to be a contradiction uh, between the idea of the universalism and nationalism because I see more the na nation as a system of, of regulating um, the welfare for, for the citizens. That's it doesn't... Very Swedish. Yes, it's very Swedish, but I am, I am sort of... Uh, I am is Swedish it, in is a this sense. a part of your identity today? Well, this is interesting. Um, I realized I was Swedish when I was 22. Uh, I'm born in Sweden. Uh, I was, uh, according to my parents, I was also made in Sweden. Uh, but my mother, my, mother, my mother was British, my father was Hungarian, and because of this blood-based citizenship, I was born as a Hungarian citizen. Yeah. And then when my father uh, became Swedish, a Swedish citizen, I became that sort of as a, as a fringe benefit. Uh, I was one years old. So, but my parents kept on talking about Sweden as another country. The Swedish food was there, the Swedish habits was this, the Swedish language, the Swedish system, so I never felt Swedish. The thing was, I never felt Hungarian or British either, so and what I was in a limbo. when you were 22? In 22, I went to Egypt. Uh, I had a friend uh, who worked in, a, she was an Egyptian university teacher, and she said, come to my university, to my classroom, and talk to my students so they can train English. So I was there like a sort of training object, and the first question from these students, boys and girls, about 18, 19, was, do you, in Sweden, do you marry because of love or because of money? So, it's a very good question. We marry because of love. Okay, but why do we do that? We do that because women can work, they can support themselves, they have the same right to inherit, they have the same possibility to vote, there is childcare so they can work, so they are independent, so they can choose a husband and vice versa because of love and not because of money. And that was of course not the question for the Egyptian couples. Uh, they were under a heavy strain of of other values. So that's when I realized, whoops, I am really Swedish. <laughs> I, 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 I will uh, give you, uh, uh, I want to react on it. But, uh, you know, I was born in Morocco and I came to ha Holland when I was four years old. And in, the, the, the idea of Europe in Morocco is that in, in Europe, you can be an individual, so people don't look at you as part of a group, but as part of an individual. And not only look at you as a part of, as an individual, which for a Moroccan is is, is is strange because family is very important, but they, but but people understand that that this individualism creates your freedom to. 
to study, to learn, and to become rich and famous. But they also understand that it's very, very important that the state, the European state, is protecting that individual. Mm. And it's very important because in, when we talk about Morocco, those countries, the state is not your friend. Never. Uh, we, we have the expression in Holland, the, 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 sta, the overheid is a schurk met a hoge hoed op. The government is, is a scoundrel with a high hat. Okay. So you have to be, in a way, we have to mistrust the state. We, of course, we live in a liberal, democratic society. We have the police. We, we have, we have, we have judges. We have, we, we can have a lawyer, etc. But we still have to mistrust. And very, very important in this, in in the check and balance, in controlling, in making sure the state is not becoming a scoundrel that will trample you, is free press. Free press is very important. Free press is very important. Journalists. Every day digging up the truth, digging up the filth, digging up corruption. Uh, uh, some, a little, little incident that leads to, to something rotten in the state of Denmark. These people, if we give up on this idea of free press, then we're dead. Mm -hmm. Then the state can sell us any lie. And, and, uh, oh. and, and I just have to fill in because this is so on the spot important because there's a survey in uh, Sweden and well it's a survey it covers several countries and it's about faith how do the individuals in Sweden uh, or in these countries I think Slovakia is in this survey as well how much do we trust the other person our neighbor for instance and Sweden and Denmark they have the highest rates for so far uh, for faith, 80% of the population think that the next person you can trust. Yeah, he's okay. Mm. And Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't look okay. No, I didn't. I, 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 uh, I, no, Roger. Anyway, and this, this is, well, how come, I think in, in uh, Albania and Bulgaria it's down in 8%. So you don't trust, and in and a lot of other countries, of course, you don't trust your neighbor or the state or the police. So what makes Sweden and Denmark special? Well, it's traceable back to the freedom of speech. Sweden was actually the first country in the world to have a, a state law, what do you say, foundation, founding law, yeah, about freedom of speech, and there was also a paragraph about transparency, that the um, authorities, they had to show the documents, the mm. protocols, the, the judges' um, mm. documents. It was open Accountability. to people. Accountability, thank you. My English is yeah, not transparency. Transparency. Yeah, transparency. And this is the key to high faith. Yeah. So yeah. this is a, a very... Interesting connection. Is, there, is this something the, the Swedish people are really proud of? Like it, no, they take it for granted. Mm. The fish don't see the water they're swimming in. Uh, so this is uh, this is interestingly it enough. Needs, it, it, you need immigrants to understand. Yeah, to understand how special it is. In a way, actually, you do because they do not appreciate this enough. That's my point of view. I will try to come back when. Even we were still talking about the issue we had today and this evening. And Roger, you told that next year we should change the why the fascism is modern. Well, if we were not talking that much about fascism t this evening, uh, what is modern today? What is the thing which is going on in Europe? Well, you see, I, I, that is a very non-academic question, you see. Uh, that is not an insult to you. Uh, but what I keep on having to defend is the idea that you, there is the idea that reality is plural. Mm. It's in, absolutely basically plural. I mean, what I keep finding is if you, if you, if you've never been to Italy, you know what Italy is. Uh, if you don't know the language, you have ideas. My, my wife, when she came to England, lot, 
she found that the English loved talking, telling her about Italy. They would say where they'd been on their holiday <laughs> and what their food was like and what the government was like. And, 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 and they often didn't ask her a question. And then they, they'd, get, they'd tell me, your wife's really interesting. Well, she hadn't said anything. They were, <laughs> they were saying that they were interesting. So it's easy to have a preconception about a country when you don't know it. The more you know the language and the culture and you make, meet people, so if you ask me now, tell me about Italy, I couldn't answer. Mm. There's, a, there's a, a, an empty ignorance and there's a full ignorance. There's an ignorance which comes from the fact that it is impossible to formulate in a single phrase the complexity of things. Modernity now is full of the most incredible range and it's getting more and more varied of different phenomena. Mm. And for example, I just live in one little place called Oxford. And there are many Oxfords. And of course, the, the, the joke is that tourists come to Oxford to see Oxford. Well, they can't see the mythical Oxford because you can only... Oxford is not a place, it's an experience. And the only way you can have that experience is to be an Oxford student. And then every Oxford student's experience is different. There's a wonderful song by Simon and Garfunkel, We've All, all Gone to Look for America. I could probably, if I spoke Slovak, spend years looking for Slovakia. And the fact is that Slovakia is all the potentials, all the different experiences, all the different histories. And there's a Roma Slovakia, and there's an immigrant Sl Slovakia, and there's, there's upper class and corrupt politician and idealistic politician and Catholic and Jewish and all these. And Yet, and yet, there is something over this, a bit like this, this ceiling here. There are all these different unique individuals sitting here, and I must say, I am very impressed that you came, because in England, nobody would come to this. <laughs> nobody would go to listen to three strange foreigners t talking about Britain. I mean, it was just impossible. We're talking okay. about Britain. <laughs> I mean, talking about, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, That's I so mean, imperialist. It, no, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I meant that. If, if we were in Britain, this room would be That's empty. Wonderful. Okay. So, so what I'm saying is, modernity is characterised by its extraordinary mm. fragmentation, atomization. Precisely what the fascists wanted to stop was the the breaking down of reality into lots and lots of different places. They wanted a total, whole, integrated reality, which leads to concentration camps, it leads to obsessions with purity, it leads to controlling the press. What fascists want to do is to create a singular order, a, a reality. It's like me trying to get my son to tidy up his bedroom. It is impossible. I can create a mini authoritarian state, I can threaten him, I can bribe him, I can give him money, I can, I can lock him out of his room, I can do everything. But until he himself individually looks at the room one day and say, what a mess, uh, it is impossible. So why don't we accept the fact democracy is a mess? Modern, modernity is a mess. We have to, as it were, live with the mess like I have to live with my son's bedroom, yeah? But I still love my son. And I tell you what I love about the messiness of democracy. It is infinitely superior to some psychopathic male imposing an order on our lives. We must celebrate the messiness, tolerate other people's messiness, Become anthropologists. When you meet a fanatic, don't try to kill them or argue with them. Just think, what a curious way of looking at the world. Is this really what you believe? That, uh, having a mother-in-law from another country is very, very useful if you want to do that. <laughs> so I would say, I can't answer your question. Okay. Uh, so but it, it's, it's a good question. We must always keep in our hearts mm. the fact that you think you're normal because you're you, but you're really mad, okay? And what you will encounter in other people is their madness. And if mm. I accept you are mad and you accept I am mad, then we could have a beer together. Good. <laughs> Oxford experience. Uh, Elizabeth. Well. Again, and don't take this as criticism, but I forgot the question. <laughs> it's, like, it's like ages ago we heard that. No, sorry. <laughs> we, 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 were, we tried to go back to the idea of what's modern, what, what, if it's not fascism. 
Well, I would say the subject for next year, mm. I think, should be fear. Because you talked about rage, but, but I think fear is the dominant uh, emotion and uh, over Europe and in, in, in the world. And fear is contagious. Uh, and it also is very anti-intellectual. It's not good for thinking. So, and we are afraid of, of refugees, we're afraid of racists. A lot of people are afraid. And this is actually one of the biggest threats, I think, uh, to democracy. Because fear makes you demand new rules, new laws, new ways of acting towards each other. So I would suggest a theme about fear. Okay, thank you. Abdul Kader. Yeah. Um, if, I, if it was up to me, which it isn't, um, my, my next offers would be a crisis in education. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I think we're living uh, in a time where um, we're talking all, all the time about this historical moment, but we're not teaching our children anymore what it means to be to be living in historical times. Um, history uh, was, a, for me, learning history was a gift for me because I come from a very small uh, Berber minority from Morocco. My parents are semi-literate. They don't read, we had two books at home, the telephone book and the Quran. And, uh, and, 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 and I went to school and I was always thinking about what is identity, what is identity, who am I? Muslim, Moroccan, Dutch, Rotterdam, um, in love, out of love, I don't know. And then uh, in high school, I had this teacher of history, and uh, he was, he was a, a, a wonderful man, wonderful personality, was very tough, but he was teaching history with a, with a very strong idea, which was, we are all human beings that are being baked in the oven of history. Every one of us comes out of history. And when you understand that, and the gates to critical thinking, to knowledge, to rel relativism, open up, you, st you start to understand that, 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 that human beings are weak, that we make mistakes and that little mistakes have great consequences and we should not be judgmental about it. The thing is to think about it, to think about it and understand and go deeper, deeper, deeper. And he made, he made everyone crazy in the classroom mm. except me because what we were saying, he was saying to me in a, in a, on, a, on a different level, that's how I felt it, like, you may think you are confused, but all human mankind is confused. You are also a child of history. When you find out where you come from, you will understand this and this and this and this, and you will accept the other. Mm. And this was not easy for me, because I will give you an, why this was not easy for me. Uh, it has to do with when you, when you are, come from a minority, you feel very vulnerable, because the majority is everywhere. And this creates resentment. I always understand people from minorities, even if they're right wing mm. or extremist, you look at them as, as with, with like they're funny, but I see their vulnerability because they feel threatened. And when I was young, I, 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 I come from, I have this Muslim background, and when I went to high school, the satanic forces came out by ah. Salman Rushdie. Mm. And, uh, and, and, I, and I, my identity was Muslim, but, but, but in a way, my identity was made by other people telling me I was a Muslim. And when the book came out, I understood it as an insult to Islam. And I hadn't read the book. The only thing I knew, I, I loved reading, but I thought this is a bad book because it's, it's making my already very vulnerable position even more vulnerable. And I felt it as an insult. So one day in the classroom, the teacher said, uh, we were starting to talk about freedom of expression and, and the satanic verses. And I said, this book is evil. The people in England, they were right, they were burning the book. And then the teacher said, why, why are you so angry? I said, well, because, because this book is, 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 is attacking my religion. And then, and then it got a very heated argument and I was sent out of the classroom. But afterwards I understood that it was not attack, that I didn't feel as an attack of my religion, but as an attack on my identity. Yeah. Mm. Um, the, the book was about the messiness of identity, about things that, that, that religion is not something fixed, that it's not monolithic. That it's, and for me, it, I took it as an insult, like they were almost insulting my own father and mother. And thank God I had a teacher of history who taught me that 
that this feeling is universal. It's, it's, you can, it's a bad feeling when you can take distance from it, but you can only take distance from it when you understand it. And you, and you accept that it, that it is there, you have to deal with it. And that opened up. And I think when we do not teach our children what history is, the critical thinking, relativizing your own position, understanding you're not the center of the world, that, 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 that when you react emotionally, there's a story behind it. I think we don't, when we don't do this, then, then fascism have, has a chance to win. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have maybe time for two, two questions from audience. And, uh, and then uh, I will let you to... Ah, no. Máme priestor asi na dve otázky. Okay, so we have room for two questions because then we continue with our program. So I think there is also a mic, yeah, it's mine, that will be traveling. And you may also ask in Slovak. And they will also, so you may start uh, ask your questions in Slovak and our guests will stay here so you can have also a personal encounter with them during uh, the time when Elizabeth will be signing her books or during the time while we are still here. If you could say that I'll sign books if anyone wants to. Thank you. Um, okay, Elizabeth, you've touched on an issue that I've been thinking about um, quite a lot in my um, in, in the, uh, recently, and um, that is freedom of speech. Where does it end? Um, and this is a question for all of you. Where does freedom of speech end? And, uh, because um, what I've noticed um, are two sort of extremes that are claiming um, the sort of limits of freedom of speech. And one, 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 is, one, one claims that there is no freedom of speech and you know, like, you can talk about, um, that you, you can deny Holocaust and all these extreme um, sort of things. And on the other extreme is the um, politically correct sort of PC um, um, discourse. And I've, uh, I've seen violence incited by both of these things. So, um, yeah. I'm not sure I, I can, I can try to answer the question as I see it. Uh, I think freedom of speech has a limit and the limit is of course the regulations we have in our laws. We have probably here as well hate speech laws. We have, uh, I can't slander anyone, say anything about anyone else. Um, so there are regulation and each legal system has put the limit in different places, but we all have limits, so it's not completely free. Uh, and the interesting thing with this limit is that until that limit, words are words, and after that limit, they are actions, criminal actions. And this is very important because uh, when you want to make the hate speech laws, for instance, harder and make it more difficult to say things, terrible things and on the internet or whatever in social media, uh, you, you, we're going in a different direction, I think. Uh, I think that it's a guarantee for democracy that we allow as many opinions as possible as possible, and that we meet other opinions than the ones we have ourselves, even though we hate them. And as Salman Rushdie, to go back to him, said that your freedom of speech reaches exact 
exactly as far as to the point where my nose begins. So it's very important that words are words and actions are actions and they're not the same. They're different things. But just when, we, when we're afraid of the climate of, of, because this is something we've touched upon, what, what's happening to our language and how do we speak to each other. I am, I am for decency, but I'm also for allowing a lack of decency. And the reason for that is that, uh, for instance, there are historians uh, in the Holocaust historians that have uh, tried to understand why did, for instance, the SS men in the Einsatzgruppen, why did they stay on murdering, committing these terrible crimes, rape, uh, murder, or you know all about it. Christopher Browning has written a fantastic book called Ordinary Men, where he explores a battalion within the Einsatzgruppe. And he realizes that they weren't especially ideological, convinced. They were ordinary men. Uh, they were, you know, postmen or students in the milk sh shop and they were just ordinary men. So they weren't very Nazi. And um, it wasn't, they were not going to get punished if they said, I don't want to do this. There were actually people who said, I don't want to do this. And they went home. That was okay. So why did they continue? And his answer is that it's the group dynamic and it's the uh, culture where only one point of view, only one opinion is allowed. No one could differ. No one could say, I don't believe in this, you're wrong. Only one opinion was allowed. So the actual the danger is not that we have a lot of terrible opinions around us. The danger is if we only allow one opinion, even if we think it's a good one, to exist. Well, well I, uh, I love uh, free speech as long as I can do the talking. Uh, because um, it's very difficult. It, I mean, hate speech is just everywhere now. I mean, the gates of hell have opened with Twitter and Facebook. And, and I, I live in one of the countries where Twitter is used obsessively by f f f f f uh, people. And hate speech is everywhere. Um, I leave it to the judge to, to say if hate speech is inciting to violence or not. It's not up to me. I leave it to the judge, and I and I believe that 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 the, that the, the, the judicial system is can cope with it, though they have problems with it. There's a big discussion. Um, but for me, I'm very much in in praise of uh, the freedom of listening. You know, how can we in this time of cacophony of so many, everyone has an opinion, everyone's entitled to his own opinion. How can we again do something about this listening? How can we bring back listening back to the core of what it means to be ha to have to have uh, a dialogue with someone with, with 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 yourself in the first place but also with the other in the second place listening is very very difficult nowadays and uh, i as an interviewer i uh, i have interviewed a lot of people with with opinions i did not agree with or with experiences traumatic experiences i did not um, uh, I did not have, and I was thinking, how can I make contact with these people? How can I understand their pain, their suffering, or their hate? And the best advice uh, a professional journalist gave me was, uh, the first question should be, why? And then just listen, and then the rest will come. And, uh, and I'm, well, I still believe in this. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Another question from the audience, if there is any. Uh, unfortunately, I can't see you, so please use the mic and raise your question. Maybe bring something else into it, and that's the exposure or experience of otherness. Uh, it's been bothering me for some time because most of my adult life, I, I believe that the exposure to otherness, uh, bringing young people, uh, uh, allowing them to travel, uh, having those experiences of other countries, other cultures, uh, can make people more tolerant. 
while on the other hand I see still more affluent people traveling to other countries, still coming back being very ignorant, feeling very superior to other people, and then also seeing people uh, uh, leaving this country, trying to look for opportunities somewhere else in Western Europe, abroad, and then still coming back because they feel that they failed in society, they never felt that they were culturally com com compatible, maybe, with the culture, or that they were welcome there. And uh, it, I think both of these people, that's, that's been boring me because I believe that I, I spend most of my studies abroad and uh, it taught me a lot how to uh, appreciate certain things about my country as well um, and my place in the world. So how does, what has experience of otherness brought to your lives maybe? And how did it redefine your, your identity? Thanks. Mm. Well, well, I'll start off as this uh, token British person. I, because I was white, male, southern English, and we had just won the war, I, I experienced the world very strangely as a very, um, as a, I felt the world had been made for me. I mean, I was uh, okay. I went to a, a, a reasonable school, and uh, otherness uh, was, I was deprived of otherness in a way, and I compensated for that, not through meeting people, but by learning other languages and falling in love with the poetry of other languages. Um, and then I, I made a big mistake. I, because I fell in love with German poetry and French poetry, I thought that every Frenchman and every French woman especially, and every German woman, somehow contained within them the soul of the language that I had fallen in love with. Uh, and I was looking for a deep romantic cultural otherness that I could fall in love with in order to escape being British. Um, and what happened was that I, I real, it took me some time to realize, of course, that if I was French and I fell in love with Shakespeare and they, that person then met my friends, they would be very disappointed because ordinary people are, are, are special, but not because they contain the soul of the language or the soul of the culture. I mean, that is a, a nationalist delusion. So what happened was that I went through a sort of uh, romantic involvement with literature. But at the other side of literature, when I had got the language going to the point where I could actually speak German and Italian and French, I saw a new world opened up, which was this wonderful fascination with people who were like me and like people I knew in Britain, but they were different. And there was this beautiful tension between their familiarity as human beings and their otherness. And so because I was... Uh, in a very lucky position. I wasn't a migrant. I wasn't in a country that was being occupied. I had no big traumas in my life, etc. My experience of otherness uh, was extremely benign. However, I then went back as a historian into the countries I'd visited, uh, France, Italy, if you go historically downwards like an archaeologist, then you start realizing that the country you're, 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 you think you're quite at home in has a terrible history. We say in English, skeletons in the cupboard. Even the Dutch have skeletons. Even the Swedes have skeletons. Um, it, countries that you think are really friendly and nice and the food is good and the beaches are good, you go back down or you know a bit more about current affairs or you know about human rights or you know... I mean, there are businessmen in England who are going to China and coming back and saying what a wonderful place it is, but they're visiting a country where people are still being beheaded, you're, you're, where, where there are regions where there are, pe there are ethnic and religious persecutions going on. In other words, if you experience Europe as a rich tourist, Tourist, you could get the feeling that, you know, modernity is fine, we're back to modernity. But so my experience of otherness is almost artificial. I've been, I've had the luxury of never really suffering for who I'm, I am. But you know, the origin of Buddhism in the story was that the Buddha was br brought up in a palace where he was protected from any confrontation with poverty, sickness, or death. 
But he had a strange feeling uh, that something was being held back from him. So he took the he took the opportunity to disguise himself as an ordinary person, went out of the gates of his palace, and there he discovered suffering, poverty, sickness, and death. And that was his revelation. Now, I had to force the revelation on myself through history and through discovering the terrible things that human beings have done. And now, thanks to the BBC and great programs, the terrible things which are going on in the world I'm in. So that is what anchors my humanity. I know that the love I, and comfort I have, economically and emotionally, is exceptional. That I probably represent less than 1% of the world's population in terms of the pleasure I have of being alive. And my heart bleeds for millions of people for whom the life I have is a total utopia. Uh, I've been lucky because of my gender and my lack of disability and where I was born and the moment in my own history where I was born. And I'm sure there are people sitting in this audience who don't have to go back very far either themselves or their, fam their parents or their grandparents, and you know what I'm talking about, because this part of Europe has had a terrible history. So otherness can be a wonderful thing, and it all makes us feel what a wonderful world it is, and it's so romantic, etc. but there's a, a, a really terrifying otherness, and I think we should confront that, because what it does is create compassion which comes from the Latin for suffering with other people. And what with the world needs far more than just love, which is often a euphemism for sex, is compassion. And if we could have compassion, uh, then the otherness of other people is no longer threatening, and we start really becoming fully human. Thank you. Oops, done it. Well, it depends uh, how much time we have. I'm, I'm, maybe two minutes. Two minutes. Well, I think otherness, I start to think about uh, what, what you just said is sort of an, a universal, uh, p preaching universality and, and what is, there's a Swedish poem that says that what, what is in the bottom of you, this is very clumsily, clumsy uh, translating, but what, what's in the bottom of you is also in, in the bottom of others. It's sort of the core in you is also the core in others. And, and what is cattle in you is the next right, is also cattle in the others. So choose the low road, choose the core, follow the core and not the cattle. So this is a terrible translation of a fantastic poem. But I just want to say from my uh, very old perspective that Otherness has also changed its meaning during my lifetime. When I grew up, I wanted to belong. I didn't know what I wanted to belong to. I wanted to be tall and have blonde hair and look like, you know, uh, Abba, the Agneta in Abba. Uh, that's right. How did you know? Oh, how did I um, <laughs> Give me, give me, give me. Yeah. But then it changed and I got to be identified with the stranger in myself, feeling a stranger all the time, wherever I was. Didn't matter really. I could connect to individuals, but I couldn't connect to other things. Uh, and then I learned to live with that, and now I'm a writer. And I, that is the next step in this process, being at home in my work, and in the language. So otherness has changed its meaning through my life, uh, and maybe in 20 years it'll have another meaning. But at the moment, otherness is, is, is identified by you know, people who don't think language is important, or things like that, other things. It's, it's, it's not connected to nationality or... Abdelkader, as you love Twitter as much as you told, you have this uh, Twitter answer to your disposition. Yeah, 140. Yes. Well, when it's no, it's 240, right? It's like, oh, it's one, it's double. It's, it's doubled, double, they yeah, doubled yeah. for you, right. Okay, so there's room for Franz Kafka. Um, 
I, I always, when, when it comes to loss, I always think of my parents because they, they, they left their own country, they went to a different culture, mm -hmm. and they lost everything. They lo lost the, the organic connection to the family, and, and, and I benefit from that. And I, I'm deeply grateful to, to, to them. And there's no way I can repay this. They changed my life and the life of my, my, my children for, forever. And, and this, this gives me a deep sense of melancholy. And when you grow up as an immigrant son, you, I, I re relate very much to you because I, I also wanted to be blonde and look like Marco from Boston, um, <laughs> the football player. But no, I didn't have this. I didn't have this because I, I was lousy at football. But you look at the world and you think that the world is perfect and you are imperfect. And, you, and this bothers you. And, and it brings the quote of Franz Kafka, once said, there is hope, but not for me, you know, and uh, so that, that, that's like the, the immigrant experience in one Kafka quote. There's hope, okay. but not for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Elizabeth Asbring, <laughs> Abdel Kader Ben Ali, uh, Roger Griffin. Ešte, ešte predtým, ako sa rozlúčime, Before we shall leave this room, Elizabeth will be here at a corner uh, with the absinthe publishing house and she will be there to sign your books. And before we do that, I think we have still one guest more. Zuzana, are you here? Zuzana wants to read, or she has something to say. It's something we need to hear today, tonight. At the same time, I want to thank you for coming. As I said, our guests will be here for some time, and they will be happy to talk to you. I believe I haven't forgot anything. Maybe one thing on 14th of March, you don't have to celebrate it, you don't have to reject it, but please don't forget this date, because forgetting is the worst that can happen to us. I want to thank all our guests, all you for coming, Central European Forum, to all our supporters. Thank you, a big thank you. I would like to thank Marta for this invitation and I would like to inform you about the call. Dozens of people prepare the last days. Marta has surprised me uh, by inviting me here, but I won't take too much of your time. We had the feeling like people working in the NGOs and in the public sector, we had the feeling that when the country shakes in its roots, like what we experienced here in Slovakia two weeks ago, then people who enjoy trust should support the good vibrations in society and should try to define what should happen now so that the terrific situation crime we experienced, the murder of uh, an investigative journalist and his, her, his friend, has a meaning so that it is not a wound with us all the time. That's why we are preparing an appeal, a petition that will be open for signature. We will appreciate uh, everyone who will sign it. We are supporting uh, those who rally, who demonstrate. We keep fingers crossed for them uh, to continue, especially tonight after uh, this evening's uh, news, because we believe this is our fundamental right. Uh, this is not a coup d'etat. In our petition, in our appeal, we also say that what is uh, desperately needed is to investigate the murders. Uh, to that end, uh, the people who are in the positions who have uh, uh, dismantled our institutions, uh, who let uh, uh, the rich and the powerful ones uh, to get away from justice. So that's why we would like to come up with a few uh, requirements that we, uh, civic society, should stand for. So we uh, require uh, the 
resignation of the famous uh, Minister of uh, Interior. He, ha however, sh he should not be replaced by a puppet. Uh, if it's uh, just a puppet, uh, we will get uh, a, a person there who would be in uh, an untenable conflict of interest. Pro 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 you know that Kutsiak was working on cases very close to political power, so these people would do everything uh, in their power if uh, that investigation uh, threatens them, uh, so they would frustrate that investigation. At the same time, we are asking for something new in Slovakia, so that uh, prosecutors, general's of uh, prosecutors general's office should ensure a special uh, supervision of the investigation through an international team, as well as uh, accepted moral uh, authorities whom we have in Slovakia, and we also require uh, the resignation of uh, the police uh, president Gashpan and special Proce prosecutor uh, uh, Kovacic, uh, who's uh, somehow stepped aside as if they have not contributed to the current situation. Representing um, NGOs uh, that have been dealing with corruption and anti-corruption for a long time, we will try to come up with a set of measures, uh, actions, uh, in a very short period of time in order to heal the wound so that we could get uh, our institutions back into our hands to make them strong again. Uh, thank you very much for uh, letting me speak to you. Thank you, Marta, and we will appreciate all your support. Uh, thank you, Susanna, of uh, the Fair Play Alliance. So now I can invite you to the signing of uh, the book uh, by Elizabeth. Is this something different? Yes. Oh, there is some meeting going on on the margins. Um, so I wish you a pleasant evening. Thank you for coming.